Chapter Twenty Five Queen Islanzadi. Aragon knelt before the Queen of the Elves and her counselors in a fantastic room made from the boles of living trees in a near mythic land, and the only thing that filled his mind was shock. Arya is a princess. It was fitting in a way. She had always possessed an air of command, but he bitterly regretted the fact, for it placed another barrier between them when he would have torn them all away. The knowledge filled his mouth with the taste of ashes. He remembered Angela's prophecy that he would love one of noble birth, and her warning that she could not see if it, it would end for good or for ill. He could feel, feel Sapphira's own surprise, then her amusement. She said, It appears we have been traveling in the presence of royalty without knowing it. Why didn't she tell us? Perhaps it would have placed her in greater danger. Is Lanzati drotting? said Arya formally. The queen withdrew as if she had been stung, and then repeated in the ancient language, Oh, my daughter, I have wronged you. She covered her face. Ever since you disappeared, I've barely slept or eaten. I was haunted by your fate, and feared I would never see you again. Banning you from my presence was the greatest mistake I have ever made. Can you forgive me? The gathered elves stirred with amazement. Arya's response was long in coming, but at last she said, For seventy years I have lived and loved, fought and killed, without ever speaking to you, my mother. Our lives are long, but even so, that is no small span. Islanzadi drew herself upright, lifting her chin. A tremor ran her length. I cannot undo the past, Arya, no matter how much I might desire to. And I cannot forget what I endured. Nor should you. Islanzadi clasped her daughter's hands. Arya, I love you. You are my only family. Go if you must, but unless you wish to renounce me, I would be reconciled with you. For a terrible moment, it seemed as if Arya would not answer, or worse, would reject the offer. Aragon saw her hesitate and quickly look at her audience. Then she lowered her eyes and said, No, mother, I could not leave. Islanzadi smiled uncertainly and embraced her daughter again. This time Arya returned the gesture, and smiles broke out among the assembled elves. The white raven hopped on his stand, cackling, And on the door was graven evermore, what now became the family lore, let us never do but to adore. Hush, Blagden, said Islanzadi to the raven, keep your doggerel to yourself. Breaking free, the queen turned to Aragon and Sephira. You must excuse me for being discourteous and ignoring you, our most important guests. Aragon touched his lips and then twisted his right hand over his sternum, as Arya had taught him. Islanzadi drotting. Atra esterna othro thirun. He had no doubt that he was supposed to speak first. Islanzadi's dark eyes widened. Atra du evanyaga unavarda. Unatra moranu leifa hunda hita onu, replied Aragon, completing the ritual. He could tell that the elves were caught off guard by his knowledge of their customs. In his mind, he listened as Saphir repeated his greeting to the queen. When she finished, Islanzadi asked, Dragon, what is your name? Saphira. A flash of recognition appeared in the queen's expression, but she made no comment on it. Welcome to Esme Elismira, Saphira. And yours, Ryder? Aragon Shadeslayer, Your Majesty. This time, an audible stir rippled the elves seated behind them. Even Islanzadi appeared startled. You carry a powerful name, she said softly. One that we rarely bestow upon our children. Welcome to Elismira, Aragon Shadeslayer. We have waited long for you. She moved on to Oric, greeted him then returned to her throne and draped her velvet cloak over her arm. I assume by your presence here, Aragon, so soon after Saphir's egg was captured, and by the ring on your hand and the sword on your hip, that Brahm is dead and that your training with him was incomplete. I wish to hear your full story, including how Brahm fell and how you came to meet my daughter, or how she met you, as it may be. Then I will hear of your mission here, dwarf, and of your adventures, Arya, since your ambush in Duweldenvarden. Aragon had narrated his experiences before, so he had no trouble reiterating them for now for the queen. The few occasions where his memory faltered, 
Safira was able to provide an accurate description of of events. In several places, he simply left the telling to her. When they finished, Aragon retrieved Nasueda's scroll from his pack and presented it to Islanzadi. She took the roll of parchment, broke the red wax seal, and, upon completing the missive, sighed and briefly closed her eyes. I see now the true depth of my folly. My grief would have ended so much sooner if I had not withdrawn our warriors and ignored Ajahad's messengers after learning that Arya had been ambushed. I should have never blamed the Varden for her death. For one so old, I am still far too foolish. A long silence followed, as no one dared to agree or disagree. Summoning his courage, Aragon said, Since Arya has returned alive, will you agree to help the Varden, like before? Nasueda cannot su- succeed otherwise, and I am pledged to her cause. My quarrel with the Varden is as dust in the wind, said Islanzadi. Fear not, we will assist them as we once did, and more, because of you and their victory over the Urgles. She leaned forward on one arm. Will you give me Brahm's ring, Aragon? Without hesitation, he plucked it off his finger and offered it to the queen, who pulled it from his palm with her slim fingers. You should not have worn this, Aragon, as it was not meant for you. However, because of the aid you have rendered the Varden and my family, I now name you Elf Friend and bestow this ring, Arin, upon you, so that all elves, wherever you go, will know that you are to be trusted and helped. Aragon thanked her and returned the ring to his finger, acutely aware of the queen's gaze, which remained upon him with disturbing perception, studying and analyzing. He felt as if she knew everything that he might say or do. She said, Such tidings as yours, we have not heard in the like, we have not heard the like of in Duweldenvarden for many a year. We are accustomed to a slower way of life here than the rest of Allegasia, and it troubles me that so much could occur so swiftly without word of it reaching my ear. And what of my training? Aragorn snatched a furtive glance at the seated elves, wondering if any of them could be Togira Ikonoka, the being who had reached into his mind and freed him of Durza's foul influence after the battle in Farthendur, and who had also encouraged Aragorn to travel to Elismira. It will begin in the fullness of time, yet I fear that instructing you is futile, so long as your infirmity persists. Unless you can overcome the shade's magic, you will be reduced to no more than a figurehead. You may still be useful, but only as a shadow of the hope that we have nurtured for over a century. Islanzadi spoke without reproach, yet her words struck Aragon like hammer blows. He knew that she was right. Your situation is not your fault, and it pains me to voice such things, but you must understand the gravity of your disability. I am sorry. Then Islanzadi addressed Oric. It has been long since one of your race entered our halls, dwarf. Aragon Finariel has explained your presence, but you have aught to add? Only royal greetings from my king, Hrothgar, and a plea, now unneeded, for you to resume contact with the Varden. Beyond that, I'm here to see the pa- that the pact the- that Brahm forged between you and the humans is honored. We keep our promises whether we utter them in this language or in the ancient language. I accept Hrothgar's greetings and return them in kind. Finally, as Aragorn was sure she had longed to do since they first arrived, Islanzadi looked at Arya and asked, now, daughter, what befell you? Arya began to speak in a slow monotone, first of her capture, and then of her long imprisonment and torture in Gilead. Sephira and Aragon had deliberately avoided the details of her abuse, but Arya herself seemed to have no difficulty recounting what she had been subjected to. Her emotionless descriptions roused the same rage within Aragon as when he first saw her wounds. The elves remained completely silent throughout Arya's tale although they gripped their swords and their faces hardened into razor lines of cold anger. A single tear rolled down Islanzadi's cheek. Afterward, a life elf lord paced along the mossy sward between the chairs. I know that I speak for us all, Arya Dronengu, when I say that my heart burns with sorrow for your ordeal. It is a crime beyond apology, mitigation, or reparation, and Galbatorix must be punished for it. Also, 
We are in your debt for keeping the location of our cities hidden from the shade. Few of us could have withstood him for so long. Thank you, Death Ervor. Now Islanzadi spoke, and her voice rang like a bell among the trees. Enough! Our guests wait tired on their feet, and we have spoken of evil things for far too long. I will not have this occasion marred by lingering on past injuries. A glorious smile brightened her expression. My daughter has returned, a dragon and her rider have appeared, and I will see us celebrate in the proper fashion. She stood, tall and magnificent in her crimson tunic, and clapped her hands. At the sound, the chairs and pavilion were showered with hundreds of lilies and roses that appeared twenty feet above their heads and drifted down like colorful snowflakes, suffusing the air with their heady fra fragrance. She didn't use the ancient language, observed Aragon. He noticed that while everyone was occupied by the flowers, Islanzadi touched Arya gently on the shoulder and murmured, almost suits too softly to hear. You never would have suffered so if you had taken my counsel. I was right to oppose your decision to accept the Yahweh. It was my decision to make. The queen paused, then nodded and extended her arm. Blagden. With a flutter of wings, the raven flew from his perch and landed on her left shoulder. The entire assembly bowed as Islanzadi proceeded to the end of the hall and threw open the door to the hundreds of the elves outside, whereupon she made a brief declaration in the ancient language that Aragon did not understand. The elves burst into cheers and began to rush about. "'What did she say?' whispered Aragon to Nari. Nari smiled. "'To break open our finest casks and light the cook fires, for tonight shall be a night of feast and song. Come!' He grabbed Aragon's hand and pulled him after the queen as she threaded her way between the shaggy pines and through banks of cool ferns. During their time indoors, the sun had dropped low in the sky, drenching the forest with an amber light that clung to the trees and plants like a layer of glistening oil. "'You do realize, don't you,' said Sephira, "'that the king Leifin mentioned, Evendar, must be Arya's father.' Aragon almost stumbled. "'You're right.' and that means he was killed by either Galbatorix or the Forsworn. Circles within circles. They stopped on a crest of a small hill, where a team of elves had set out a long trestle table and chairs. All around them, the forest hummed with activity. As evening approached, the cheery glow of fires appeared scattered throughout Elismira, including a bonfire near the table. Someone handed Aragon a goblet made of the same odd wood that he had noticed in Ceres. He drank the cup's clear liqueur and gasped as it blazed down his throat. It tasted like mold cider mixed with mead. The potion made the tips of his fingers and ears tingle and gave him a marvelous sense of clarity. What is this? he asked Nari. Nari laughed. Veil nerve? We distill it from crushed elderberries and spun moonbeams. If he needs must, a strong man can travel for three days on naught else. Sephira, you have to taste this. She sniffed the goblet, then opened her mouth and allowed him to pour the rest of the fail nerve down her throat. Her eyes widened and her tail twitched. Now that's a treat. Is there more? Before Aragon could reply, Oryx stomped over to them. Daughter to the queen, he grumbled, shaking his head. I wish that I could tell Hrothgar and Nasweda. They'd want to know. Islanzadi seated herself in a high-backed chair and clapped her hands once again. From within the city came a quartet of elves bearing musical instruments. Two had harps of cherry wood, a third a set of reed pipes, and the fourth nothing but her voice, which she immediately put to use with a playful song that danced about their ears. Aragon caught only every third word or so, but what he did understand made him grin. It was the story of a stag who could not drink at a pond because a magpie kept harassing him. As Aragon listened, his gaze wandered and alighted among, upon a small girl prowling behind the queen. When he looked again, he saw that her shaggy hair was not silver, like many of the elves, but bleached white with age, and that her face was creased and lined with a dry, withered apple. She was no elf, nor dwarf, nor, Aragon felt, even human. She smiled at him, and he glimpsed rows of sharp teeth. When the singer finished, and the pipes and lutes filled the silence. Aragon felt himself approached. Aragon found himself approached by scores of elves 
who wished to meet him, and more importantly, he sensed, Sephira. The elves presented themselves by bowing softly and touching their lips with their first and middle fingers, to which Aragon responded in kind, along with endless repetitions of their greeting in the ancient language. They plied Aragon with polite questions about his exploits, but they reserved the bulk of their conversation for Sephira. At first, Aragon was content to let Sephira talk, since this was the first place where anyone was interested in having a discussion with just her. But he soon grew annoyed at being ignored. He had become used to having people listen when he spoke. He grinned ruefully, dismayed that he had come to re rely upon people's attention so much since he had joined the Varden, and forced himself to relax and enjoy the celebration. Before long, the scent of food permeated the glade, and elves appeared carrying platters piled with delicacies. Aside from loaves of warm bread and stacks of small, round honey cakes, the dishes were made entirely of fruit, vegetables, and berries. The berries predominated. They were in everything, from blueberry soup to raspberry sauce to thimbleberry jelly. A bowl of sliced apples dripped with syrup and sprinkled with wild strawberries sat beside a mushroom pie stuffed with spinach, thyme, and currants. No meat was to be found, not even fish or fowl, which still puzzled Aragon. In Carvajal and elsewhere in the Empire, meat was a symbol of status and luxury. The more gold you had, the more often you could afford steak and veal. Even the minor nobility ate meat with every meal. To do otherwise would indicate a deficit in their coffers. And yet the elves did not subscribe to this philosophy, despite their obvious wealth and the ease with which they could hunt with magic. The elves rushed to the table with an enthusiasm that surprised Aragon. Soon all were seated, Islanzadi at the head of the table with Blagden, the raven, Daithjer to her left, Arya and Aragon by her right hand, Auric across from them, and then all the rest of the elves, including Nari and Liafen. No chair was at the far end of the table, only a huge carved plate for Sephira. As the meal progressed, everything dissolved round Aragon into a blur of talk and mirth. He was so caught up in the festivities, he lost track of time, aware of only the laughter and the foreign words swir swirling over his head and the warm glow left in his stomach by the fail nerve. The elusive harp music sighed and whispered at the edges of his hearing and sent shivers of excitement down his side. Occasionally, he found himself distracted by the lazy, slit-eyed stare of the woman-child, which she kept focused on him with single-minded intensity, even when eating. During a lull in the conversation, Aragon turned toward Arya, who had uttered no more than a dozen words. He said nothing, only looked and wondered who she really was. Arya stirred. Not even Ajahad knew. What? Outside of Duweldenvarden, I told no one of my identity. Brahm was aware of it. He first met me here, but he kept it a secret at my request. Aragon wondered if she was explaining to him out of a sense of duty, or because she felt guilty for deceiving him and Sephira. Brahm once said that what elves didn't say was often more important than what they did. He understood us well. Why, though? Did it matter if anyone knew? This time Arya hesitated. When I left Elizmira, I had no desire to be reminded of my position, nor did it seem relevant to my task with the Varden and the Dwarves. It had nothing to do with who I became, with who I am. She glanced at the queen. You could have told Zephira and me. Arya seemed to brittle at the reproach in his voice. I had no reason to suspect that my standing with Izanzadi had approved, improved, and telling you would have changed nothing. My thoughts are my own, Aragon. He flushed at her implied meaning. Why should she, who was a diplomat, a princess, an elf, and older than both his father and grandfather, whoever they were, confide in him, a sixteen-year-old human? At least, he muttered, you made up with your mother. She smiled oddly. Did I have a choice? At that moment, Blagden jumped from Islanzadi's shoulder and strutted down the middle of the table, bobbing his head left and right in a mocking bow. He stopped before Sephira, uttered a hoarse cough, then croaked, Dragons like wagons have tongues. Dragons like flagons have necks. But while two hold beer, the other eat deer. The elves froze with mortified expressions while they waited for Sephira's reaction. 
After a long silence, Sephira looked up from her quince pie and released a puff of smoke that enveloped Blagden. And little birds, too, she said, projecting her thoughts so everyone could hear. The elves finally laughed as Blagden st- staggered back, cawing indignantly and flapping his wings to clear the air. I must apologize for Blagden's wretched verses, said Islanzadi. He has ever had a saucy tongue, despite our attempts to tame it. Apology accepted, said Sephira calmly, and returned to her pie. Where does he come from? asked Aragon, eager to return to more cordial footing with Arya, but also genuinely curious. Blagden, said Arya, once saved my father's life. Evendar was fighting an Urgle when he stumbled and lost his sword. Before the Urgle could strike, a raven flew at him and pecked out his eyes. No one knows why the bird did it, but the distraction allowed Evendar to regain his balance and so win the battle. My father was always generous, so he thanked the raven by blessing him with spells for intelligence and long life. However, the magic had two effects that he did not foresee. Blagden lost all color in his feathers, and he gained the ability to predict certain events. He can see into the future? asked Aragon, startled. See? No. But perhaps he can sense what is to come. In any case, he always speaks in riddles, most of which are a fair bit of nonsense. Just remember that if Blagden ever comes to you and tells you something that is not a joke or a pun, you would do well to heed his words. Once the meal had concluded, Islanzadi stood, causing a flurry of activity as everyone hastened to do likewise, and said, it is late, I am tired, and I would return to my bower. Accompany me, Sephira and Aragon, and I will show you where you may sleep tonight. The queen motioned with one hand to Arya, then left the table. Arya followed. As Aragon stepped around the table with Sephira, he paused by the woman child, caught by her feral eyes. All the elements of her appearance, from her eyes to her shaggy hair to her white fangs, triggered Aragon's memory. You're a werecat, aren't you? She blinked once, then bared her teeth in a dangerous smile. I met one of your kin, Solemnbum, in term and in Farthendur. Her grin widened. Aye, a good one he is. Humans bore me, but he finds it amusing to travel with the witch Angela. Then her gaze switched to Sephira, and she uttered a throaty, half-growl, half-purr of appreciation. What is your name? asked Sephira. Names can be powerful things in the heart of Duweld and Varden, dragon. Yes, they are. However, among the elves I am known as the Watcher, and as Quickpaw, and as the Dream Dancer. But you may know me as Maud. She tossed her mane of stiff white bangs. You'd best catch up with the queen, younglings. She does not take lightly to fools or laggards. It was a pleasure meeting you, Maud, said Aragon. He bowed, and Ar- Sephira inclined her head. Aragon glanced at Oric, wondering where the dwarf would be taken, and then pursued Islanzadi. They overtook the queen just as she reached the base of a tree. The trunk was ridged by a delicate staircase that spiraled up to a series of globular rooms cupped and suspended in the tree's crown by a spray of branches. Islanzadi lifted an elegant hand and pointed at the eyrie. You, you needs must fly there, Sephira. Our stairs were not grown with dragons in mind. Then she spoke to Aragon. This is where the leader of the dragon riders would dwell while in Elizmira. I give it to you now, for you are the rightful heir to that title. It is your inheritance. Before Aragon could thank her, the queen swept past and departed with Arya, who held his gaze for a long moment before they vanishing deeper into the city. Shall we see what accommodations they've provided us with? asked Sephira. She jumped into the air and sailed around the tree in a tight circle balancing on one wingtip, perpendicular to the ground. As Aragon took the first step, he saw that Islanzadi had spoken true. The stairs were one with the tree. The bark beneath his feet was smooth and flat from the many elves who had traversed it, but it was still part of the trunk, as were the twisting cobweb banisters by his side and the curved railing that stood under, slid under his right hand. Because the stairs had been designed with the elves' strength in mind, they were steeper than Aragon was used to, and his calves and thighs soon began to burn. He was breathing so hard when he reached the top, after climbing through a trapdoor in the floor of one of the rooms. He had to put his hands on his knees and bend over to pant. 
Once recovered, he straightened and examined his surroundings. He stood in a circular vestibule with a pedestal in the center, out of which spiraled a sculpture of two pale hands and forearms that twined around each other without touching. Three screen doors led from the vestibule, one to an austere dining room that might hold ten people at the most, one to a closet with an empty hollow in the floor that Aragon could think of no discernible use for, and the last to a bedroom overlooking and open to the wide expanse of Duwelden Varden. Taking a lantern from a took in the ceiling, Aragon entered the bedroom, creating a host of shadows that jumped and swirled like madcap dancers. A teardrop gap large enough for a dragon pierced the outer, outer wall. Inside the room was a bed, situated so that he could watch the sky and the moon while lying on his back. A fireplace made of gray wood that felt as hard and cold as steel when he touched it, as if the timber had been compressed to unsurpassed density and a huge, low-rimmed bowl set in the floor and lined with soft blankets where Saphira could sleep. Even as he watched, she swooped down and landed on the edge of the opening, her scales twinkling like a constellation of blue stars. Behind her, the last rays of the sun streaked across the forest, painting the various ridges and hills with a hazy amber that made the needles glow like hot iron and chased the shadows back toward the violet horizon. From their height, the city appeared as a series of gaps in the voluminous cap canopy, islands of calm in a restless ocean. Elismira's true scope was now revealed. It extended for several miles to the west and to the north. I respect the riders even more if this is how Vril normally lived, said Arion. It's much simpler than I expected. The entire structure rocked slightly in response to a breath of wind. Saphira sniffed her blankets. We have yet to see Vor Vorengard, she cautioned, although he sensed that she agreed with him. As Aragon closed the screen to the bedroom, he saw something in the corner that he had missed during his first inspection. A spiral staircase that wound up a dark wood chimney. Thrusting the lantern before him, he cautiously ascended, one step at a time. After about twenty feet, he emerged in a study furnished with a writing desk, stocked with quills, ink, and paper, but no parchment and another padded roost for a dragon to curl up on. The far wall also had an opening to fly through. Sophira, come see this. How? she asked. Through the outside. Aragon winced as layers of bark splintered and cracked under Sophira's claws while she crawled out of the bedroom and up the side of the compound to the study. Satisfied? he asked when she arrived. Sophira raked him with her sapphire eyes and proceeded to scrutinize the walls and furniture. "'I wonder,' she said, "'how you are supposed to stay warm when the rooms are open to the elements.' "'I don't know.' Aragon examined the walls on either side of the breach, running his hands over abstract patterns that had been coaxed from the tree by the elves' songs. He stopped when he felt a vertical ridge embedded in the bark. He tugged on it, and a diaphanous membrane unspooled from within the wall. Pulling it across the portal— he found a second groove to hold the hem of the cloth. As soon as it was fastened, the air thickened and became noticeably hotter. There's your answer, he said. He released the cloth and it lashed back and forth as it rewound itself. When they returned to the bedroom, Aragon unpacked while Sophia coiled up on her dice. He carefully arranged his shield, bracers, greaves, cough, and helm, then stripped off his tunic and removed his shirt of leather-backed mail. He sat bare-chested on the bed and studied the oiled links, struck by their similarity to Sephira's scale. "'We made it,' he said, bemused. "'A long journey, but yes, we made it. We're lucky that misfortune did not strike upon the road.' He nodded. "'Now we'll find out if it was worth it. Sometimes I wonder if our time would have been better spent helping the Varden. "'Aragon! You know that we need further instruction. Brom would have wanted it. Besides, Elzmir, Elzmira, and Islanzadi were certainly worth coming all this way to see. Maybe. Finally, he asked, What do you make of all this? Sephira parted her jaws slightly to show her teeth. I don't know. The elves keep more secrets than even Brom, and they can do things with magic that I never thought possible. I have no idea what methods they use to grow their trees into such, such shapes. 
nor how his Lanzati summoned those flowers. It is beyond my ken. Aragon was relieved that he was not the only one who felt overwhelmed. And Arya? What about her? You know, who she really is. She hasn't changed, only her perception of her. Saphira chuckled deep in her throat, where it sounded like stones grinding against each other, and rested her head on her two front feet. The stars were bright in the sky now, and the soft hoots of owls drifted through Elismira. All the world was calm and silent as it slumbered away the liquid night. Aragon clambered underneath his downy sheets and reached to shutter the lantern, then stopped, his hand an inch from the latch. Here he was in the elves' capital, over a hundred feet in the air, lying in what used to be Vrail's bed. The thought was too much for him. Rolling upright, he grabbed the lantern with one hand, Zorak with the other, and surprised Zephira by crawling onto her dais and snuggling against her warm side. She hummed and dropped a velvet wing over him as he extinguished the light and closed his eyes. Together they slept long and deep in Elismira.